In this lecture, we'll talk about matrix transformations. So far, everything we've discussed in this course has been about solving systems of linear equations, but now we're going to change gears a little bit and talk about how these ideas come up in different contexts. So first, let's recall that we've talked about the matrix equation ax equals b and the corresponding vector equation x1, a1, plus x2, a2, plus, 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 all the way up through xn, an equals b, where the a vectors are the columns of the matrix a. And that those two equations represent the same relationship. They are solved in the same way. We set up the same augmented matrix and row reduce it in the same way and interpret the results in the same way. But what we're going to see is that matrix equations specifically can actually arise independently from systems of linear equations. We're going to see equations like ax equals b come up in different ways. One of the different ways that these matrices come up is in the context of functions. So the function here is going to go from Rn to Rm, and it's going to be defined by the rule t of x equals a times x. So the idea here is the function takes in as its input a vector, and what it does to that vector is it multiplies the vector by a matrix. So in this case, just as an example, we're going to pick the matrix uh, that we see here, and then that means that t is going to take the vector that you plug in and multiply that vector by this matrix A. So if I plug in the vector 1, 2, 3, then what the function does to that vector is it multiplies that vector by A. So there's my x, this is A, and that's x again. So remember that when we multiply, we go across the row of the matrix and down the vector. So that's going to give us 2 times 1 is 2, plus 0 times 2 is 0, plus negative 3 times 3 is negative 9, 2 plus 0 plus negative 9, that's negative 7. Negative 1 times 1 is negative 1, 4 times 2 is 8, 5 times 3 is 15, so negative 1 plus 8 plus 15, that's 22. And so that's the result of plugging this vector into this function t. As another example, we can plug in the vector 5, 6, negative 2. Again, we're going to multiply it by the same matrix, that's how this function is defined. And again, we're going to multiply that matrix by that vector in the way that we learned before. So going across the first row of the matrix and down the vector, we get 2 times 5 is 10. 0 times 6. And negative 3 times negative 2. That's going to be 10 plus 0 plus 6 is 16. And then going across the second row of my matrix and down the column, we get negative 1 times 5 plus 4 times 6 plus 5 times negative 2. That's negative 5 plus 24 plus negative 10, and that's going to be 9. And so the result here of plugging in this vector is 16, 9. Now I want to establish some vocabulary that we're going to be using when talking about these functions. So any function that goes from Rn to Rm, so the the inputs of the function are vectors with n entries, and the outputs of the function are vectors with m entries. Any function like that is called a transformation. And Rn, this set of inputs, is the domain of the function. And Rm, the set of potential outputs, that's called the codomain of the function. And given an element in the domain, the vector that we get when we plug that vector into the function is called the image of x. So t of x is called the image of x. And then the set of all of the actual images that we get, which may not be the full codomain, that's called the range of t. So the range is all of the different outputs that we actually get from plugging into the function. So let's do another example here and just use this terminology to get familiar with it. So here we have a matrix that has three rows and two columns. So I can multiply that matrix by vectors with two entries. And what I'll get is vectors with three entries. So the domain of t is R2, and the codomain of t is R3. So first of all, we're just being asked for an image. So the image of 2, negative 1, that's just using our terminology to say what's t of 2, negative 1. And in this case, that's what I get when I multiply this matrix by the vector 2, negative 1. Well, now I have three rows, so I'm going to go across each of the three rows of this matrix and multiply them by the corresponding entries in the vector. So for the first entry, I get 1 times 2, plus negative 3 times negative 1. In the second entry, I get 3 times 2, 
plus 5 times negative 1. And then the third entry, I get negative 1 times 2 plus 7 times negative 1. And that's going to work out to be 2 plus 3 is 5, 6 plus negative 5 is 1, and negative 2 plus negative 7, that's negative 9. So that's the image of 2, negative 1 under this transformation. Now a slightly different question. Here we're asking for an x in R2 so that the image of x is 3, 2, negative 5. So in other words, we're being asked to solve this matrix equation. 1, negative 3, 3, 5, negative 1, 7, times the mysterious vector x, which is going to have two entries, x1, x2. And we want that to equal 3, 2, negative 5. So this is a matrix equation. This is an equation that looks like ax equals b. And we know how to solve a matrix equation like that. We set up our augmented matrix, 1, negative 3, 3, 5, negative 1, 7. We augment the matrix by tacking on the vector b as a final column. And then we row reduce that. And when we do that, the reduced echelon form that we get looks like 1, 0, 3 halves, 0, 1, negative 1 half, 0, 0, 0. Putting that back into the variable form, that tells us that x1 equals 3 halves and x2 equals negative 1 half. So that's the vector x that we're looking for. The vector x has entries 3 halves and negative 1 half. That would be the solution here. Now, this is sort of the opposite of finding an image, right? We knew what the image was x, of x was supposed to be, we just didn't know what x was. And so we say that x is the pre-image of that vector 3, 2, negative 5. One more question here. Now we have a vector 3, 2, 5, and we're asking, is that vector in the range of t? So this is just another way of asking us to solve the matrix equation, ax equals b, or in this case, ax equals c. So we're wondering, is there a vector x so that when I multiply a times x, I end up with this vector c, ax equals c. Does that equation, that matrix equation, have any solutions? So we solve this in the same way that we did the previous example. We set up our augmented matrix, And we row reduce it. But this time when we row reduce it, the reduced echelon form ends up looking like this. And since we've got a pivot in the last column, that means that this equation is inconsistent. It has no solutions. And so the answer to the question is this in the range of t? The answer to that question is no. I want to end by talking about a couple special types of transformations. So one specific example that we might see is the matrix uh, that looks like this. So it's almost all zeros. It's got a couple of ones in it. But critically notice that the last column and the last row are both filled with zeros. So in this case, when we take their transformation, when we multiply a vector x1, x2, x3 by this matrix, what happens is the first entry is unchanged, the second entry is unchanged, but the third entry becomes a zero. And so what this is doing is what we call in mathematics a projection. So it's taking a, a vector or a point in three-dimensional space, and it's killing the z-coordinate. It's turning the z-coordinate into a zero. So that means that wherever our point is in space, it's going to get collapsed down to the corresponding point on the xy plane. So wherever the point is, wherever its x and y and z coordinates are, when we apply this transformation, it's just going to get projected down onto the xy plane. Another special transformation that we might see is something called a shear transformation. So in this case, the matrix looks like this, with this number here in the upper right-hand corner being any real number. And the effect here is that this has sort of a slanting effect on the vectors that we plug in. So the picture here is showing that our original shape is just a square. So a square that's one unit on each side with the lower left-hand corner at the origin. And then what I'm doing is I'm applying this transformation to every point in the square. 
And the image of that square is this parallelogram, this slanted square. That's what I get when I plug that square into my function. So if s is my square, then t of s is what's drawn in red here. If I change the value of c, I still get a shearing effect, but it's a different kind of effect. In this case, I've changed the value of c to negative 1.5, which means the square gets sheared to the left, and it gets sheared a little more sharply than it did in the previous example, where the c value was positive 0.5. In the special case where the value of c in the upper right hand corner is zero, then what happens is that the square and the image of the square are actually the same. So the original square gets unchanged by this transformation. It's the same square that we started with. And in fact, we can check that, because if I look at a times x, in this case my matrix is 1, 0, 0, 1. If I multiply that by any vector x1, x2, then when we work that out, we just get x1, x2. And this is what we call an identity transformation. That when we plug our any vector into this function, we just get that same vector back. It's a very boring function because it doesn't actually do anything to that vector x. And this is an important example of a transformation that we'll be talking a little bit more about as we go along.